So hello everybody, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Bernd from Amsoda, is my brother, Alex, we're the best looking brothers in blockchain history. Um, I'll give you a small introduction of what we're doing tonight. Um, so we're doing this together, uh, my company Lamsoda and Pikapipe, the company from, from my brother. Um, Alex will start. Then we have Paul from Eurosphere and Eurocoin talking. Uh, Trevin is here, a special guest and master of chin. Um, and hopefully everything works out. We will talk to Israel, our connection, uh, if we hear from, from our and that's post introduction, so we skip the ad now. <coughs> Start with my brother. So. <coughs> So, so hello from my side. Why, maybe you're wondering why we're talking English. Um, it's because we have 1,000 and more viewers on Facebook and they are from all over the world. They're like a, a, a human blockchain listening to us tonight and that is why we have to talk in English. So thank you for showing up tonight. Um, we had this spontaneous idea, Philip, uh, Bernd and me to make this little meetup and we're really happy that a lot of people showed up and want to talk with us tonight. The agenda in the right order, so I will start, then we have a Skype with Vior, um, one of the core developers from NXT and Ardor via Skype. Then we have Trevin, he is um, the former director of the Ardor NXT group, and he will introduce himself, he's a blockchain nomad for decades <laughs> already, and for ages, yes, and then we have Paul from Heroes Fair uh, talking about esports and blockchain. What I'm going to do tonight, um, I will present, pre-present, so to say, a book chap chapter that I wrote together with Natalie and Thomas, my colleagues. And the book chap chapter is about what game studies actually have to do with blockchain and where we find connection of, of those two uh, topics. Um, the, the book chap chapter will come out in, in late March. So basically why blockchain? And now the big question. If you are the real blockchain expert, give me a five. And if you just heard the word for the first time getting this invitation, you say one. <laughs> <laughs> Even Philip only gives me a two, two, three. I think most of the people uh, underestimate themselves maybe here uh, tonight. Um, to keep it simple, why blockchain? It's all about trust. Trust sending cryptocurrencies to each other, trust making any kind of contract, basically, between different parties. And I'd like to give you an example. Basically, this is an example that really happened in real life 32 years ago. And uh, I think it might be a good time, as head of the Center for Applied Game Studies, to use Playmobil to explain you this example. Philip is... I'm not telling you the real story why I use this example, that you can ask me later. But imagine the following situation. We have the pirates. We have the Native Americans. And um, we have the rangers. Basically, the rangers and the Native Americans try to live kind of in cooperation. They used to be at the same place. And the Native American thought that the rangers are kind of friends. But then one day, the pirates showed up. And the pirates, they make a lot of money. Uh, going after other ships, so they offered a lot of money to the rangers, but this was a big secret, you know, the Native uh, Americans didn't know that. Uh, and they told the rangers to be the trusted third party between a contract of the Native Americans and the pirates for a peace contract. The peace contract is basically that every time the pirates pass by um, the tents of the Native Americans, the books, the canons, just on one side. 
One day, the pirate ship turned around, the cannons were still on their promised site, and bombed the Native Americans. It's a really sad story. 150 years later, the Martians came to Earth, and they say, oh, we find skeletons and we find feathers, so there's still the pirates, there's still the rangers, so there had to be a third party. What happened? The rangers wrote a book about this. The rangers invented a story that the Indians were thieves, and that is why, with the help of the pirates, they had to kill all the, uh, all the Native Americans. So, why do we need blockchain now? If we would have done this contract um, between the, uh, the pirates and the Native Americans using the crowd, so to say, and that other people have to validate the contract and other people even have to store it on an online cloud storage, of course, the pirates could have still bombed the Native Americans, but the Martians would have known that uh, they would have been betrayed and that you cannot trust the pirates or, uh, or the rangers. And of course, uh, signing this contract, also the rangers could have signed this contract. But there's still another issue. We don't really know, and this is a part I'm focusing on for like a year now, and this is about identity and blockchain technology. So, for my understanding, smart contracts need some kind of proof of identity. For Austria, for example, we have the HRUST providing a citizenship card. So basically, just being, they are on the ship and they are in their tents, and they sign the smart contract, they don't really know if not someone else um, is signing the contract in behalf of them. For example, the Lego pirates sign this uh, contract, and then they get killed and they say, oh my god, we have the contract. And then the Playmobil pirates say, haha, uh, there has never been a contract. So what they can do to secure a contract would be to actually meet in a room, so the pirates and the, um, the Native Americans meet in a room and they sign a contract, but um, still, of course, after they got bombed, you can delete all written papers. They could have asked, wrong direction. They could have asked the rangers to be within them in the room to sign the contract, as I said before, but also very easy to destroy it. They could have used uh, or give, gave the contract to many other people, but still they could be deleted. So the solution would be in this case to sign a contract that even for signing a smart contract you need um, to approve an identity that you are allowed to sign the contract and it proves who you are. And in this situation, I think uh, the pirates would not have bombed the poor Native Americans. But of course, we discussed this before. If someone is putting a gun at the hand, you can still uh, sign the contract, uh, although you don't want to sign it. So you could, to solve this solution, you could even get other Native Americans that need to double sign contracts, for example, and uh, you can go on and go on. But basically, what is blockchain? Blockchain is a contract. It can be a currency sent, it can be any kind of contract, and it, solves, it should solve the big problem that we humans do not trust each other <coughs> anymore. And if we would have had this playing Playmobil 37 years ago, I could have told you that Philip kicked me out of the game the first time my brother and Philip allowed me to play with them. <laughs> so I played with them like for 10 seconds. And, and this is the reason maybe why I never joined Lime Soda and why I don't want to come here because I know yeah, what a they might kick me out again. Um, so this is just very short. What you really have to distinguish is between the digital currencies and functional tokens. So currencies are like Litecoin and Bitcoin, you use them for payment, and functional tokens are to basically start an event triggered with the functional token. So basically, to give you a metaphor, it's like um, you put all the card machines where you um, put money in and you get the token that you use to play your card machine. I can tell you now for hours why, func why functional tokens that 
also um, are tradable and have a price uh, variation will, will <laughs> not work, but I think I even have this maybe in the slides later. But what I'm going to talk with you the next 20 minutes is about the book chap chapters from Play, Games and Blocks. And I'm just giving to give you short um, examples of how blockchain technology and game studies um, relate to each other. So one example that I quite like is the Algo platform. Basically there you um, spend the Algo coin to bet on future events. So we all know the example from um, uh, crowdsourcing of wisdom with the, uh, the weight of the cattle. And basically uh, the experts uh, didn't estimate um, the weight of the cat in such a good manner as um, the, the crowd did. So this is the principle and in May 2017 it was asked for example is Bitcoin going above $10,000 by November and several thousand people betted on yes and as we all know this, um, this happened. Then we have the attention economy game. This is a game I really like to play. Um, and there is a, a great website that you can all attend, it's for free, you can use it, it's fun, there's now a competition, and this is the minimum viable stage of the website, so you can start to play around with it, but more and more features are added uh, every two or three weeks. It's called wildspark.me, and what you're doing at this minimal first website, so to say, is that you bet on the success of YouTube videos. So basically, you can either bet on your own videos, as a content provider, you can bet on videos from others uh, that you think they're going to be a success. Um, and basically, this is a really nice way to monetize your success as a blogger or as a video YouTuber, and more and more platforms are going to be added in the near future. So why it's part of me, it's really fun to, to go on this website and play with us. The social media game. Um, basically, you know the value of social media platforms derived from the number of uh, people subscribed to it and derived from the number of uh, articles written on it, comments written on it, and likes that the platform gets. And for those companies that are listed on the stock exchange, this makes Facebook worth uh, billions of dollars. And there's a platform, it's now on, I think, 1,500 most important websites on the world, actually. It's called steamit.com. And they make it a little bit different. Basically, if for getting likes or upvotes, it is called, you receive a cryptocurrency called Steam. And there are a lot of games even surrounded um, about this game. Well, so why can the platform give you Steam? They say that, okay, with um, more and more people interacting, we as a platform generate, uh, so, so to say, a platform, our, 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 our Platform is more worth, the more people subscribe, the more people write, and every user has a certain kind of voting power. So for example, you have to decide, this is also kind of a game, that I have 100% voting power a day, and should I give 100% of my voting power to the article from Lime Soda, and then maybe 100% from an article from Ahinda, one of my steamed friends at the back, so we met via this platform and the articles, and and then someone comments nicely and they give him also some of my, of my voting power. And when you go into your wallet, you see that you have the Steam wallet, you have the Steam power wallet, and you have the Steam dollar wallet. And uh, basically, they wanted to secure the platform so that you are not going to um, convert every Steam that you get into Bitcoin immediately. So you have the chance every week when you get your Steams to convert it to Steam power. And this gives you, as an account holder, more power and your voting are more um, sustainable for, for others. What we did, Ahinga and me, the last year, was that we did kind of a mini science project. If we can earn money for a school in Taiwan, but not in Austria, but in Brazil. Because um, one of our friends, uh, Bruno, he works there as a scientist, and we got like, um, then Litecoin, then I waited until Litecoin was $100, and with, the, with that $100 that just derived from hitting the like buttons, so to say, uh, we were able to purchase these tablets here. If we had waited two weeks longer, then we would have bought 
be, would have been able to buy like three times more. But I'm happy because today it's a red day, so it's quite the same as it was. As it was. At the moment, I, I bought it. Then eSports is, of course, uh, related to our subject. And I started my eSports re research project in the year 2005, 2006, actually. And so I'm very happy that this um, is a big topic nowadays. And there we have two platforms you should look at and you should compare them. One is uh, called firstblood.io. This was one of the, at that time, early 2017, with $5 million, I think, one of the most successful ICO at that time. I think if they would do it nowadays, it would have maybe $50 million. Um, and then <coughs> we have Paul later speaking about a lighthouse project that is currently um, uh, developed in Austria, and they were the first ICO, uh, so, so to say, reflecting Austrian law. And I'm very looking forward to listen to the talk from Paul later on about Hirokoin. But as you see, um, and, and why are those platforms necessary? Basically, they engage esports players. Like there's um, there's one guy who doesn't play that good League of Legends as I do. He's just gold, and I'm platinum. But sometimes I play with, uh, <coughs> with David um, because, like, he's the brother from one of my friends. So you know, I show him how League of Legends works. <laughs> but uh, we can basically with, with uh, first or Hero Coin, we, we could start our little betting games, and I can see I, uh, who is going to win or which group is going to win. And again, we could do this off chain. So if we trust each other, we could just say the next time we meet at Lime Soda, I give you a euro or a coffee. But we don't trust each other, so we have to do it on the blockchain so that we have the blockchain itself or the hero coin system as the trusted third party. The in-game items, items themselves get more and more tokenized with a typo. Tokenized. I have to switch it a little bit. Um, and basically, we think that all those in-game in -game items from World of Warcraft and especially from games like... Um, Clash of Clans and so on, prepare society for what is coming and this is the blockchain tokens and that virtual tokens are worth something that you can trade them. So you can thank us game scientists and gamers because if it would not exist there would be no blockchain and there would be no reason to talk about it. So we prepared or games prepared society for uh, blockchain technology but now something freaky is uh, starts to develop, and this is that the in-game token that you can use in the game to buy your laser sword, or your laser for your, sh your ship to kill other ships, is a blockchain traded token. And now go on the chart. So for example, if you would have bought uh, the tokens for your laser here, it would have been very cheap to buy your laser cannon. And some people that bought the tokens for the laser here, maybe they got a very <laughs> bad working laser for that amount of money uh, this, they, they spent because they needed to spend like $80 cents for the token and this guy here spent $20 cents. So basically I as a game scientist I don't like the idea that the functional token in the game is actually also traded. Some people might say it is more fun <coughs> to get the best price for the laser cannon, finding the best day to trade the token, but still, this is a token with a trading volume of only $122,000. So it's very, very easy to manipulate. Even we all together in this room, having one coin here, one coin there, can manipul manipulate this price uh, really, really easily. Then we have iGaming on the blockchain. And this one project that was really exciting, they started the ICO like a year ago. The white paper was nice, so to say, or good to read, and, and it's working on the Graphene network, that's a very, it's like the same license as Steemit, for example, is built on, but I think what they do or what they want to achieve is really good, so they are by far not a scam or something like that, they are just facing a lot of regulatory paperwork to file in the different countries to actually start their decentralized betting platform. The main idea is that uh, as a holder of PeerPlace, you're kind of a shareholder of the system itself, and you have sports betting on it, you have gambling machines on it, you have cards, one card plays one-to-one -one on it, and all the shareholders get a certain 
share of the money lost from at least one of the players. So let's see how this is going to, to develop in this year. Um, the first game that started is Schere uh, Papier. Um, but not so many people are playing this, obviously. So when they really start with sports betting on NBA games and so on, more and more, more people would use this service because basically you bet with other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Litecoin, and the beer place token is just your share on this decentralized company. The mining and fortune games, so who of you guys is fortune or mining? We have three forges here. Um, the difference is that mining is like mining Bitcoin, so you need a lot of computer power to, to go for it. And fortune, and this is for the proof of uh, work algorithm, and fortune is proof of stake. It means that you have a certain amount of the whole stake of the coin. So, at the, at the, so for example, here with NXT, we have 100 million coins, and my stake is 8,000 coins. So I'm by far not a whale, I'm a little, little fish. But um, at some day or another, because of the stake, I have a uh, total amount of, of coins, and of the time my little node is running, I get some cryptocurrencies as my computer gets selected to validate um, the transaction on the blockchain. And if you have any question about it, we have Trevin here, the director, former director from the other NXT group, and later on uh, via Skype, Lior, and they can tell you much, much more about their platforms. I'm just a fan of, of, of how they develop things. Then we have the Twitter game, and this game is really exciting. Basically, when you start, Twitter is only existing for cryptocurrencies. All other topics <laughs> make no sense at Twitter anymore. When you start to follow only the cryptocurrency people, and the game, I, you know, we consider there is the bull bear and the Twitter bird. So basically, you have all the founders or, or like leaders of the different foundations uh, twittering. So you really see the personal opinions um, of, of the person. So for example, we have here Vitalik Buterin. He is uh, he's the face of Ethereum. And some month ago, there was this big discussion with him. What is more risky, uh, the possession or, or what, what does impose more risk to others, heroin or the possession of child uh, porn? And this was the moment, very sentimental from my side, where I started not to like Ethereum so much more. The system is, of course, really good and everything, but following the argument from the face of Ethereum, I would have banned him from doing any tweets, actually, because uh, this is having impact on people. The other guy here, Charlie Lee, he is from Litecoin, and I liked him from the moment he started to play Twitter um, as Mario Kart. So for several weeks, he only uh, tweeted like um, bananas or ghosts. So, for example, when Litecoin uh, became on market cap place number five, and then he posted a banana so that Monero is sliding on the banana. I don't know him in person, of course, but I like this kind of tweeting in a, in a funny way um, a little bit more, but um, we'll see. And here we have the market influence game. We have Bitfury George here. And what I did for several times is um, finding relations from his tweets with um, the price of coins. And here with Litecoin, you can say maybe this was just a tweet at the right time that he shipped Litecoin. But you see the tweet was on the 8th of December. And I marked here the 8th of December. And you see this, this green candle and this green candle. But actually the comparison, and I had no time this morning to find it and put it on the slides, is the moment he told the people that he's going to invest in MR coin. MR coin was a coin in the 200s. And he started to tweet about MR coin. And I thought, maybe I should buy them. And then I forgot. And I went to my computer. And like two days later, he said, I'm going to invest in Emma coin. And from that moment, this coin went from 50 cents to $9. So this tweet had, or this investment and the tweet had a big impact on the market. And of course, we also have the tweets on the other way around. And this is actually funny because um, we had here in September this big situation that, as you know, China banned for the fourth or fifth time first ICOs and then the exchanges. 
And that was a really bad day. I was booked for a presentation that should have taken like 40 minutes. And I read this and everything was, was read. So I was, oh my God, blockchain is really just a bubble. Fuck off, I sell everything. Then I went on stage and I said, oh, I'm Alex from Dona Uni. Um, you know about this, you know about that, you know about this, here you have my contact data, goodbye. I went outside and then Litecoin went from $20 to $50 and I said, thanks God, it's recovering. Um, but now, let's zoom out. This was the big crash. This was something that made me happen to uh, piss off some people that, called, that booked me for a presentation. So, like this, we have, we have it here with the Korea crisis and the futures and so on. So basically, in relation, when we zoom out in two years, this might be that in the chart in two years, but of course it can be also be there in two years, so no one really knows. <coughs> um, and this is from today. There is a, a Twitter site called uh, a blogger called Cointest, and what they do is they write some decent articles, but they always mix them with really, really hard um, Headlines. So only the Austrians would know it, but I think they are the Dedlich Alles from Crypto Space on the Heute Zeit. <laughs> and today, I, some hours ago, like today at noon, um, they, they wrote like German regulators order crypto exchanges to halt brokerage business. When you click on the article, you read a really good story, and this is about the German police or regulators found an illegal exchange. Uh, betraying and scamming the people and they shut it down. <coughs> so I made this tweet today. It's again your headline. How about success? German regulator closes unregistered crypto exchange, making blockchain trading more secure for German citizens. But people nowadays do not lo longer read articles, long articles like when you click here on this link, they just read the headlines. So like people see this, fuck, Germany is banning cryptocurrencies. And when you're from Germany, you press sell, 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 sell. And they are really good in this FUD, in this fear, uncertainty, <coughs> uh, and doubt. And then we have another big game at the moment, and this is really exciting to follow. It's called the brand name game. Um, it's basically Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash, and what's going to be the real Bitcoin? And there's this guy called Bitcoin Jesus, uh, Roger mm -hmm. Fair. He was responsible, more or less, with some other guys for the Bitcoin Cash fork last summer. What he did is he, bought, he has the Bitcoin.com domain. He bought most of the Twitter handles that are directly Bitcoin. Or at Bitcoin, I think he is owning it at Twitter. He bought so many other blogs and uh, media agencies and so on to basically uh, post wrong information or, or very silly uh, tables comparing something. And he has a big, big group of people shilling that Bitcoin Cash is actually Bitcoin. We will see how long they can still do it and how long they have the money to, to, to make this happen. And then there's this other story that there's this television show on CNBC. And there's one of the good guys, I think, the Whale Panda. I really like him. And he found out that the executive uh, director of the Bitcoin Cash Fund is related with Gabi Wasensteiner. And she's the marketing manager of CNBC. And on one night, uh, I forgot to put this tweet on the slides, but on one night, CNBC really tweeted stupid things. And we think that Powell just got the mobile phone from Gabi and tweeted on behalf of CNBC, like, fuck you, Bitcoin, and stuff like that. And when you follow the TV station CNBC on, uh, online, you will see that a lot of stuff they uh, proposed that you should buy might be maybe bought or manipulated. So the shield, for example, Ripple, when it reached $3, all the people bought it and <laughs> went $1.50. And on the other side, there was, as you remember, that Coinbase last December added Bitcoin Cash overnight without actually telling the people. And this here you see how unprofessional the whole market and how immature and how the market is still in its infancy so such a big decision that Coinbase, the biggest dollar, euro, and so on to crypto exchange, is adding Bitcoin Cash support overnight, 10 days before they actually were supposed to do it. Um, everyone can, can take his own opinion about it, but uh, uh, Furry George wrote some nice tweets about it. 
And then we have the matrix, uh, the matrix game. So when you click on coin market cap, and coin market cap is itself is a game, I'm going to talk about that later. But when you click on markets, you see all the markets where cryptocurrency is listed, and you see the volume and the price and so on. Um, and how is this volume? Uh, on, and here we have um, actually the, the slide. On one day in the morning, um, the coin market cap guy, and who is he? He is one guy, I think, living in New York in his apartment who had the idea of making a website, uh, making an average price out of the different exchanges and, and posting it. And as the Korean exchanges at that time traded higher than the Austrian and German exchanges and American exchanges, he put out of the metric uh, the price from the Koreans and just put a little star on it. And he posted that he did that, and he did it in the morning, he posted it like 11 hours later. So what happened in the head of the people Suddenly, they saw a big drop of all the coins they have, but in real life, on their exchange, there would not have been a drop. The drop was just because this guy removed the biggest market, being the highest price, from the average matrix. And so you thought that your coin lost, but actually, if no one would have done anything and no one would have panicked, sold, the Litecoin would have been in Europe $220 still. You know what I mean? And then he, he didn't even apologize. He said, oh, this morning I excluded it. And this is one guy that made one lovely website selling all those banners for really a, a high amount of money. And this is another um, metric game, so to say, game-like moment. And this was when Ignis was released on the first exchange. And it was really great to see, because like we, such a blockchain token, we don't know what it's worth. You never know, it's just what the people are willing to, to pay for it. And this is why most of these ICOs are really senseless, because the founders of the ICO say, my token is worth one euro, and you get 20% off if you buy it in the first week. So 20% off from an amount, one single guy in Singapore decided that his coin will be worth in a year. So this new coin arrived on the market, and it was really great to see like the buy orders and the sales orders, and in relation to Bitcoin, on which price on that day the community agreed on, uh, on um, the price of the coin. So this was, as from the scientific perspective, really nice to see. And, uh, and then we have the, the, the game hunters for the green candles. So some people like, oh my god, there's such a green candle. That green candle means that a lot of people buy for high price. And then they buy like here. And then the, the, the person that initiated maybe on the slow volume traded coins the green candle sells here and the people get wrecked and uh, lose uh, their money maybe. And then we have here, and this is really important for you to know if you're ever going to buy a coin. This is really, really important to know. You see here the market cap, and we see here that Bitcoin at the time of the screenshot has $158 billion market cap. So what is this market cap? Market cap is just the volume of the last 24 hours and the number of people that bought the tokens with a certain price multiplied with the number of coins available on the market. So we have here the Jin coin. It was traded. One people bought a coin, one person bought a coin for $1,831. Today I took another look. Today we had 10 people, or one person 10 times, buying uh, the coin for $959. So you see this is a real fraud, because it's basically the same amount, 10 times. And this takes the coin to a market cap of $65 million, and it is ranked on 244 coin market cap. So this person buying his own coin, he created, again, day by day, can say from himself, I'm the owner of a company with a market cap of $56 million. And all the journalists in Austria and from all the blocks, they are not trained and they just look on market cap and they say, oh, this guy is from Chin. That's the company with the market cap of $56 million. And if you don't look at the metrics, and if you want to invest in this coin, and some real person is spending the $959, you will never get your money. 
this is a, a funny joke, and basically the whole crypto community is based on jokes. So everything what crypto people are doing is just jokes, <coughs> jokes and so on. Um, and this is always when a lot of new people come and there is real fear and threat in the town that the price go, goes down and crypto Twitter is, um, <coughs> is giving votes. So now we are at the scan part and as you might want to invest in some coin, uh, take care. So this is an ICO from Prodium. They told that they're going to be the next big thing in packing the um, ecological industry of vegetables with a coin and you can earn money being part of this and being the owner and they made a press release and blogs and even newspapers started to, uh, to build, uh, to write stories about it. Some people on Twitter already started to warn that there's just, just stock photos on the website and so on but people don't really uh, care and they even made a competition that they said when you are a girl uh, writing the name of the ICO here above your breasts then you get 100 coins extra for submitting the picture and what was yesterday morning they took you away, we don't know yet but millions of Ethereum million, Ethereum worth million of dollars and on their website they wrote the word penis um, then we have on, 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 on Twitter so basically when you go on Twitter and you follow for example Charlie Lee and the scammers are so aggressive nowadays that they, they have the handle Satoshi like this and below his posting they start to post send like onto this address and I donate uh, and you, even Charlie Lee himself says it, please um, tell Twitter that, that uh, he's, uh, this is like a fraud but he can't do anything because he himself cannot um, delete this, uh, this his tweets or the, the, the persons that tweet on his um, Twitter site hide Charlie Lee from reading their tweets. So basically now Charlie Lee is warning that um, there are going to be a lot of um, forks from Litecoin this year and in his opinion he is not um, supporting any of those forks and uh, he asks us, the community, kind of to, to help. And even with the Chelorida ICO, you see that um, it was this discussion when Ignis is going to be released and someone had the handle um, Chelorida NXT and they say go on this link uh, and then you get your wallet and everything and of course this was a big fraud um, and the only thing Chelorida could do was to, to warn the people that five minutes ago someone posted on their Twitter handle uh, a joy and or anything else. So the hackers game, and this is quite of the end of my presentation, or near by the end. Um, here you see in US dollar the biggest hacks out of exchanges, and this is like the experienced traders say: only if you have your private key, that you are owner of the coin, and you should not leave coins on the exchanges. And like on January 18, this was like some days ago, um, nearly 500 million worth of NEM got stolen from an unregistered um, Japanese exchange. So not registered with the government, but a lot of people were using it. Um, and having a look on, on the trading, it was like there is a rumor and the prices went down. And then the CEO from CoinCheck said, oh, we got robbed. And then the prices got up. Because everyone knew, okay, it's true, he got robbed. I'm not using this exchange. I buy, 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 buy. Um, so this is, this is really, uh, in, in Austria, would say they, they all have a husher that <laughs> trade on the market. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really amazing. We have, of course, the slang game. You can see it on my um, pullover. So a lot of new words, even like you can compare it with massive multi-online playing games and the words that have been created at that time. So we have wrecked, we have hodl, Hodl derives from a typo in the year 2013, I think, Natalie, 13, 14, um, where one drunken guy said, oh, don't sell Bitcoin, just hold, and he did this typo, and now he created this word, and he doesn't have, I think, the copyright on it or something like that, he would have been very rich of all the people using this word. And we have the collector's games. So here you see the day um, crypto celebrities started. Who of you is, going, is playing crypto celebrities right now? 
Is anyone playing it? So basically you can collect celebrities, pictures of celebrities, and you pay Ethereum to own the digital unique picture of a celebrity. So I took this screenshot here on the first day, and <coughs> Vitaly Kukan, the founder of Ethereum, was worth 20 Ethereum, um, compared with today's price, like 20,000 euros, and already 31 people changed this card. And now we have from this, from this morning, Vitaly Buterin is now worth 151 Ethereum, so his card is now worth 300,000 euros. What they actually do is that the people can claim the celebrities that they are part of the game, so they, they can say, oh, I'm part of your game, and then the celebrities can decide to which charity they are going to donate the money or something like that, um, but I'm sure that some celebrities will start to sue them maybe, and I'm really looking forward how this game is going to, to continue. But you also see in this case that, that big whales have so much Ethereum, they are so rich they don't really know what to do with it, so they buy um, cards of celebrities. What I like more is CryptoKitties, <laughs> and for actually making something on the Ethereum blockchain, CryptoKitties are for me the best case example, because what they did is they did not invent some new token or currency, they just used the original currency Ethereum, as a fee for playing the game, and you pay the transaction fee in this um, currency. What you can do is, um, you get your kitty, and you get another kitty. Um, there's no incest possible, so you need a kitty from another breeding tree. And then you say, this kitty and this kitty, they're going to have kitty sex, and then a new kitty comes out. And our professional players, Natalie, so all questions about crypto kitties later on to Natalie, but for example, you see here the cool town, so if you have a faster cool town, this kitty would be worth more. You have the number of kitties that are born. So my most lovely kitty is, was 363,000 kitty. Now, today we are at 500,000 plus. Um, you see the owner of the kitty and how much it would cost me to breed, plus, of course, the fee I have to pay to the Ethereum network um, to start the breeding process. Fun fact, Wikileaks donated to CryptoKitties to President Trump and to Secretary Clinton, and so the CryptoKitties are now in the US National Archives. Um, they are stored as long as the America, America exists. Um, so I really like this approach that CryptoKitties are also now a part of um, the American culture. However, um, we were talking about cars, so what you can do nowadays is you can buy luxury products like cars or big houses with um, Bitcoin and Litecoin. And what I predict is that at a certain point, owners of luxury houses will only sell their property for Bitcoin, but for like a double amount of what they would have uh, collected in, in euros. So like if I have a house that is worth 1 million euro, I'm not selling it in, in in, uh, in, in fiat, I would sell it in Bitcoin, and I would say I like to have Bitcoin worth uh, 3 million euros on that day. And then the whales starting to buy luxury properties in the best places on earth, just using cryptocurrencies, and this might lead to um, the next big um, crisis in the uh, investment and, and housing industry, real estate industry. So, just now for maybe two more minutes and then we go to Leo Jaffa. I'd like to explain to you the other network a little, little bit because we have Trevin here with Leo on the phone later, so um, I should not talk about it too much. But this was the moment the other network was born. Basically, it derived from NXT. Um, and these were the fir for first blocks forged on the um, other network, and this is how it looks today. So you really see that like every 50 seconds a new block is, fu uh, is found on the network. And what you see here perfectly is that the block you find contains a transaction from the euro. Trevin, I think, is going to explain it later, and from Ignis. And now it's the fun part, because uh, before I Skype with Lior, start the Skype, I'm going to write on this wonderful flip chart. So what makes, makes it so special is when you have Ethereum, 
and you build another token for your customers, like the Alex token. And this is a loyalty program, and I want to be my clients to be to collect these loyalty tokens. My <coughs> clients would also need Ethereum to send the loyalty tokens. So I cannot bundle this for them, or it's rather difficult. Um, on GitHub, there is already one project mentioning how it might work. But um, this is one of the main issues. Besides that, CryptoKit is, had the blockchain bloat. So basically, it, uh, it showed the blockchain bloat. So it, uh, it, uh, there was a big, big traffic jam on the Ethereum blockchain just because everyone gets CryptoKit. So now imagine you are a high class company starting your decentralized app, and your customers have to pay a lot of fees in Ethereum uh, to get the transaction through. And also they have to wait one hour because everyone is playing crypto tickets. So they know these issues and they are working hard on it um, uh, with Plasma and, and other ideas um, to, 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 to face this issue and to make a much better blockchain because as their number two market cap and a lot of systems are running on it. But Argo did an, another approach. So you have the other system and you have the other coin. But basically, Alder is only responsible for securing child chains and transactional EGS. So EGS is basically, in my understanding, from the functionality what NXT was before. So you have the possibility to issue currencies. You have the possibility uh, to issue tokens. We have a marketplace here. We have a voting system here, and so on. All you know from NXT. So you can easily, easily use EGS for your professional purpose as business. If you make something more, that <coughs> needed more functions than EGIS can offer you, um, you can apply for a child chain later. And with a child chain, you can create your own ecosystem, so to say, and uh, take functionalities that are already there. With smart uh, transactions, you can build your own with them functions. And the really cool thing is that you can set up a bundling account and the bundling account is actually responsible for paying the fees from your child chain. So if I make the Alex token as loyalty program here, my clients can send the Alex token as points, as loyalty points, without needing to have other. I'm bundling this account, I'm paying the fees, and the fun fact, I also forge and collect for forging fees from others, so this is kind of a sustainable network. Um, after trying, at least from uh, our research, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of other, but of course, for many cases, you still need the complicated smart contracts from Ethereum to work on it. So thank you from my side, and what we try now is to call Leon. We just need to get the um, amplifier. One second. You are already you are already here on the slides. Can you try to say something if we hear you? You can go on the Just one moment. No, it's a bit The sound just comes from the system. I'm sure the technicians are working on the audio. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Da müssen wir in die Tür hinter uns gekriegt. Geht's? Do you hear me? Do you see me? Okay. So you need to just... It should work now, but we don't hear you via... Uh, you, you hear me now? Yes, no, okay. super, perfect. So... Uh, um, okay, but I, I, I hear you very, very loud now. Um, okay. Uh, how do you it now? We, we hear you quite good now. So okay, good. I don't know if, you, if, if I turn my camera on and if you see us. So if you don't see us, there are a lot of people in the room. Um, uh, no, I don't see you. To somehow have to turn on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> So, ah, now I see you, yes. And now you see the people. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I see something. <laughs> That's good. So there are some, some people in the room and um, maybe we do a little Q&A and then do a short introduction. So this is Leo Chaff and he is the brilliant mind behind Cello Reader and responsible for the smooth working um, style of the other network. And maybe, Leo, you can just introduce yourself much better than I could do to the people. Uh, okay, so my name is Leo Yaffe. I'm a, a managing director of uh, Gelorida, the company that develops the NXT and Arlor uh, technologies and uh, blockchain. Um, I, in my background, I'm a computer kid, programmer. I worked for almost 20 years. In, uh, my last uh, day job was at uh, Software AG, uh, a large German uh, software company, uh, where I manage the mainframe integration uh, business. Um, and uh, right now, I'm all focused on uh, blockchain technology. Um, and it's still Arlo, like Alex uh, presented. So, um, in your own words, what do you think makes Ardor at the moment kind of a special platform and why do you think it is needed on the market? Okay, so, so uh, the blockchain, the existing blockchain uh, industry suffers from two fundamental problems. One is called the blockchain bloat. So every transaction ever submitted to a blockchain will have to stay there forever because transactions are based on the, are packaged into blocks and every new workstation that uh, downloads the blockchain has to revalidate all the blocks and therefore all the transactions inside the blocks um, and, and this, this of course uh, is a process that grows forever um, we, we can also already see some of the public blockchain reaching sizes of well over 100 gigabytes and this is before we even uh, started to scale these, pla these platforms to their full, uh, full potential capacity. Um, I always like to uh, mention my uh, Wikipedia donation back in, in Bitcoin back in 2014 that is still uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain and it cannot be removed from there even though I don't care about it and they don't care about it and definitely you guys don't care about it every new node that joins the protocol will have to, uh, to revalidate it um, so, so what we do with, uh, uh, with our door is that we separate the blockchain into two uh, uh, two types of entities, the parent chain responsible for the security of the network, which is working uh, proof of stake, um, and the child chains, which are uh, responsible for the decentralized application platform, uh, where, you can, uh, uh, where, you can, where you can do the interesting stuff, the asset exchange, voting, identity management, uh, documents, and, and so on. And then uh, the current chain is responsible for the security of the network and it still saves all the transactions, but the child chain's transactions can be pruned, which means after they are buried deep enough in the blockchain, like uh, after 24 hours, nodes can forget this transaction and no longer uh, store them in the blockchain forever. Um, 
and you and you now join the network, you just need to download the parent chain, which is relatively slim, and receive a snapshot of the current state from one of the other uh, from, from each of the other uh, child chains. Um, if you still want to save all the history of the transactions, for example, for accounting purposes, um, you can still do that, but it no longer needs to be saved by all the uh, blockchain uh, participants. Um, is it okay? You hear me okay? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, second problem. Every transaction that is ever uh, that is submitted to a blockchain has to be processed by uh, all the nodes in the blockchain. And, and this is, um, and, and blockchains today are, are kind of the jack of all trades. If you, if you look at uh, Ethereum for once, it's used for ICOs, it's used for many uh, research projects, it's used for crypto kitties, and, and, and even if you are interested in ICO or in voting, you still need to process all the crypto kitty transactions. There is no way to separate um, a, the blockchains to, uh, to application domains. And this is another potential, uh, another potential use of the child chains, which is to uh, separate each child chain to its own application, and then in the future, um, some nodes will decide that they only want to focus on specific child chains, and ignore the transactions from other child chains, and this way uh, increase the scalability of the blockchain, uh, of the blockchain architecture. Um, okay, that's that's what I have to say. <laughs> so maybe we talk a little about um, the possibility as um, setting up private blockchains or the blockchain creation box that you are going to offer on NXT. So some people, as you know from Twitter, are curious what is going to happen with NXT, and I think there is a future for NXT, but maybe they know it from first hand, um, what, what you plan so far for the next two years or something like that. Okay, right, so, so NXT, NXT has been operational for more than four years. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good blockchain, it's, a, it's very stable, it provides you uh, an application platform which is uh, relatively flexible, even though we don't provide you the ability to deploy whatever smart contract you like. We still provide you uh, the basic blocks for decentralized application, and on top we've implemented some of the uh, smart contracts. Um, I, I still I, I, I see NXT as um, a, a, I, I still expect people to use NXT far into the future and definitely run out and support the network. One unique property of NXT is that we allow you to create uh, your own versions of NXT. Uh, we call it the NXT Starter Kit. Um, let, let's say that you want um, that you want to develop some kind of application around voting. You can start. Um, you can take Ethereum smart contract. Uh, start from the beginning, and then uh, develop everything yourself, and then. You know, fight with all the crypto kitties and ICOs on the attention or on a, on transaction fees and so on. Um, or you can or you can take uh, NXT with all the feature, clone it. I mean, it's open source, um, and and develop uh, another uh, blockchain instance which is based on the NXT source code but represents another token. Um, then there it diverges into several options uh, because obviously we don't want everybody to create clones of NXT because it dilutes the value of the NXT token itself when, when you can just clone it just like uh, Bitcoin Cash dilutes Bitcoin and Bitcoin Gold and, and all this uh, cloning does not make any sense. So we have a unique requirement, which we call the Jerrina Public License, which is an open source license um, that uh, dictates that you can, of course, clone NXT, create your own clone version with your own source code based on NXT, but you need to provide 10% of your new token back to the NXT uh, existing holders um, using a snapshot. Um, so, so, so um, 
So another another option. I mean, many organizations, for all kinds of reasons, don't want or cannot use the public blockchain. They need their own a uh, private permission blockchain. And, and when you say private blockchain, it essentially means that uh, in order to create an account, you need to somehow authenticate or get permission from someone else, from the manager of the blockchain. Um, so, so we also provide this configuration, but for this type of configuration, we are uh, we are actually selling it like a software product, like an infrastructure product with licensing fees and maintenance, um, and so. Um, yes, so, so so that's uh, so that's where NXT is going. It will still run on the public blockchain with all the applications which exist on it. Uh, and it can be and, and it can be cloned both for uh, public and private blockchains. So maybe I collect two or three questions from the audience. Is there anyone mm -hmm. with a question to Lior here? What's your favorite feature? Trevin asked you what's the favorite feature on <laughs> on other or NXT. Okay. Um, so so I, I, I think NXT has a quite a few powerful features that are not available in any other uh, blockchain at the moment. And um, to, to give you an example for uh, something simple that you want to do, for example, uh, to, set a, to set a property from one account on another account. Um, why, why is it useful? For example, you want to associate some relationship between two accounts so, so we already have the smart contract programmed into the core. You simply use it in the wallet, you set a property, and you can give it whatever value uh, you want you want to give it. And we find that just for this simplistic uh, application, we find a lot of useful uh, uh, use cases uh, inside the core and, and for third-party applications as well. Another unique, another unique uh, feature of NXT is what we call uh, phasing or smart transactions. That um, it, it's it's kind of a dependent execution of transactions based on a voting or external a, a based on on voting models defined when you submit the transactions. This, this allows you to do all kinds of interesting applications. Uh, take for example, let's say that you want to issue a token on the blockchain, but you only want uh, accounts which are whitelisted to be able to trade and transfer this token. So, so in this case, you can define a, a, a mechanism which is called asset control, which uh, dictates that all transactions related to this token Will be um, will have to comply with some voting model, and then defines this voting model to be based on account properties. So after all this complexity, what it gives you, it gives the asset issuer control over who is going to be able to trade the asset or transfer the asset. So 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 this is an example of how uh, how we can uh, use our existing features. To get uh, to create integrated uh, application, which does not require any coding, or I mean, if you want your own wallet or application, it, it requires only using the APIs um, and that, that that we expose and on which the wallet is is based. Is there another question from the audience? If not, um, I will. Yeah. Just uh, one question: Why, uh, why do you need the native app provided by the platform to access the blockchain? Did you hear it? Uh, no, no. Can you repeat the question? question? Um, why, why? Why do uh, everybody needs to use the native apps you provided to access the NXT or the other blockchain? The, the native. So, so the apps you provided. So uh, usually on other blockchains you can uh, access the data on the blockchain uh, using other services connecting to some API or something like that uh, and on other and NXT 
uh, if you want to participate in the blockchain, you need to download the apps you provide. Uh, no, it, it's not. Uh, this is uh, incorrect. Okay. You can. Uh, you don't have to download the blockchain into your local workstation in order to use it. You can connect to any node that exposes APIs. However, the the ones I think you are um, uh, referring to before the Unix distribution, we used to have uh, in our own online wallet on the Jerovida website. Uh, the problem with this is that it becomes a point of centralization. So everybody started looking at the blockchain as if it was the online node on Generida. And first of all, it doesn't scale. I mean, it was very difficult just to keep this node alive. Um, second, it's, it's against all the principle of decentralized applications. You don't want one entity to exist uh, to, to make to control the main node and everybody to trust this entity. You, you, in blockchain environment, you do want most of the entities to actually set up their own full node and validate the transactions. You, you are correct that for, a, a, let's say, for wallet and end users, it makes a lot of sense to also a, provide this uh, API service. Um, so, so, so there is a fine balance there. We, we have a feature which is called Light Client, which is, uh, it's working so-so, okay? I, I, I'm not very happy with how it's working right now, but what it allows you is to uh, not download the blockchain to your, own, uh, to your own workstation and rely on a random remote nodes for the operation of the blockchain. Are you happy? Uh, uh, kind of doesn't answer my question. So, uh, no. even if you uh, like to operate it as a full node uh, locally, uh, this is only possible uh, through the software where you provide. Okay, that's correct. You, you mean why we don't have third-party yes. nodes? Oh, yes. oh, okay. Right, so, so you're correct that the node uh, itself, the server side, is only uh, produced by Jerorinda. I mean, unlike, um, and I think it's like this with most of the blockchains today, except Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum has two, in, two implementations, but, but in most cases, a blockchain is a very complex piece of software, and to get two implementations that work together and does not contradict each other, it requires a lot, lots and lots of work and very big incentives. So, uh, so on the client side, everybody can use the API and develop its own wallet. We provide a reference implementation wallet, but anyone can uh, design a wallet, a block explorer, um, and, and, and a mobile app, and so on. And, and there are quite a few, uh, a few versions uh, available around. Okay, thank you. Maybe as, as last question from my side, uh, before we continue with the talk from Trevin. As we are here at Lime Soder and they are the two times winner of the Anton Award, so they are the, like, how to say, best e-commerce agency in Austria. Um, what do you think would, would make other or your work um, suitable for an e-commerce agency, especially speaking about the e-euro child chain, for example, that Mm. makes it easier for European companies to interconnect with the blockchain tokens. Okay, uh, so, so one, one important advantage in the Ardor uh, parent child chain architecture is related to transaction fees. I think one of the main barriers these days to adoption of blockchain applications or decentralized applications is the transaction fees. On almost every blockchain, a, in, it comes in different uh, configuration that when you do a transaction, you also need to pay a fee. And, and then it means that your users uh, cannot work transparently without actually uh, obtaining some of the native tokens of the blockchain itself. Um, and this is something that uh, Arbor sourced very elegantly because when you're working on a child chain, you actually can offload the fee payment 
for the parent chain from the end user to the business itself. And, and you can actually see it already in practice with exchanges, which actually make withdrawal transaction with zero transaction fee, and make sure that these transactions make it into the parent chain, into the hardware chain, by bundling these transactions by the bundling system. Uh, so the exchange itself covers the transaction fees of its withdrawal transactions. Similarly, I expect every business that relies on a child chain to actually offload the bundling process uh, from the end user. Uh, think about gas payment in Ethereum, okay, or, or, or fee payment in NXT. This, in Arlo, this can be offloaded to the entities that are actually interested in, in these transactions or, uh, or, or monetize from these transactions. So this is one thing. The other very important features that we have right now, we just launched it, is the AEUR uh, PEG child chain, which, uh, which where we provide a child chain token, which is pegged to the, to the euro in one-to-one, -one, and this is ensured by, uh, by a business um, that operates using the, uh, an online bank called uh, Mr. Tango. We, we just launched it into production. So far, it looks very good. Um, and that, so I have high hope that this will ease a lot the entry into this uh, blockchain platform so that you no longer need to first go to exchange and buy Bitcoin, then, then buy Argo, then buy your token, because this is not very user friendly. Instead, you will go to the bank and buy their uh, euros and immediately convert them into Ardo, where you can trade. In Ardo, you can trade between the child chains using a decentralized coin, coin exchange on the blockchain. So, thank you very much. A big applause, please, for, for Leo. <laughs> uh, we are now uh, switching to Trevin. Um, if you go to the Facebook of Lime, so that you can see us live, I don't know if you follow yes. us. Perfect. So yes, if you have time, uh, you can okay. follow the, the talk from from Trevin. Thank you for for having for coming by uh, Skype. <laughs> Goodbye. <coughs> so, Trevin, I have your talk on my laptop. Ich finde alles sofort, was ich brauche. Das ist ein Blockchain-Desktop. Wo ist die Kamera? Die Kamera ist hier, so wie ich es gesehen habe. Okay. I put I'm not too sure. <laughs> we control it. <laughs> you have to put it down. <laughs> uh, do you have a clicker? So yes, I don't here. Okay. Yeah. There is it. Let's test the clicker first. Yeah, uh, surprise photo. So, so this is this is Trevin. I, I met him on Twitter actually, um, and I'm very very happy that I met him before this big blockchain hype happened. So we became friends, easy friends. You know, this was worth three cents, so no one was talking about it. <laughs> um, and I'm very proud that he's here. At the time he met, he was the director of the other and next group. Basically, he formed the NXT group to the other and NXT uh, uh, group at Foundation. And he is a blockchain nomad. You can follow him on his website. And I just asked him to come here today and talk about the, the life of so many years in the blockchain business, all the good and bad stories that he experienced. So please, in advance, a big applause for Trevin for coming to us. Thanks, Alex and Fred, for inviting me here. Happy to come back to Vienna. Uh, I always consider Vienna like my second home in Europe. I lived here in 2010 and lived here again in 2015, and so always happy to come back. Um, so, as Alex said, I've been in blockchain space for quite a while, although not decades. Uh, I've been here since around 2013. Um, actually, started around 2011, and I was working in tech support. Um, that's what we did back then. We had to actually carry the blocks. Um, a colleague of mine uh, named Aaron, he told me, hey, Trayvon, you're in business and you're in the tech. 
uh, just take a look at this thing a little bit. But like, oh, what is it? Oh, is this thing worth uh, $3? And I look at it, it's like, what is it? It's online money. Um, what can I do with it? Uh, you can go on Silk Road and buy some stuff, um, and buy some illegal stuff at the time. Of course, I didn't use it. Um, and I said, oh, but can you cash out? At the time, no, you really couldn't easily anyway. And so I said, oh, it's just a scam. Don't care about it. Two years later, I see this coming home from work. And first thing I do is I grab my phone, call my friend, and shout, Aaron! <laughs> uh, because I thought he made a lot of money. And apparently, no, he did it as well because he sold a lot earlier. Um, but you know, I, I felt that maybe he didn't really introduce it fully to me. So I really started looking into it. Um, and I remember this ad that I saw uh, when I was on Reddit. Uh, it's a very old school ad, but uh, I've been seeing it around actually since around 2012, um, maybe a bit later. Um, and so the first place I decided to go to to learn more about this, because I figured, you know, if it hit $1,000 from $3 just two years ago, it must mean at least something. Even if there's a bit of a pump and dump, maybe, um, there has to be at least some substance in there. Uh, so I went on Reddit. Um, at the time, there were only 71,000 uh, subscribers on the Bitcoin subreddit. Now there's about 700,000. Uh, so it went 10 times, although the price went more than that. Uh, well, no, yeah, about that. Um, so I just started reading all of the threads going everywhere. Um, I was starting to get into Forex trading at the time, so I decided to look at Bitcoin markets as well. Um, this one also went up by more than 10 times, I think it's about 100,000 or something. Now we actually have this many people on the Bitcoin market Slack alone. Um, I also joined the IRC, I just pretty much coming home from work, study Bitcoin and just learn and learn and learn about it. Um, and then I bought Litecoin because it was so hard to buy Bitcoin at the time. Like getting on uh, local Bitcoins, trying to find somebody in Seattle, um, I mean, it was relatively easier compared to other places, but it was hard for me to find somebody. I also didn't really live in a very safe place. It was not a good idea to do that. Um, I hear gunshots sometimes. Not a good place. Um, and Litecoin Local. So I'm one of the first. I'm one of the few people whose first cryptocurrency they purchased, despite looking at Bitcoin, bought Litecoin. Um, and yeah, I went back to Bitcoin market still. I mean, uh, it, Bitcoin market is I say, a community that really sort of changed my life. Um, there's a lot of really good people around there. I'm actually now an administrator on there, so I invite, uh, invite you guys to join. That's bitcoinmarkets.co. Um, but anyway, so I went on IRC and started talking, and I was ranting about how there were so many clones of Bitcoin, uh, but nothing really bringing any substance. I mean, there were a few that had some interesting factors here and there. Um, there was this thing called Quark that looked interesting, but ended up turning out to be a pump and dump. Uh, they hired a celebrity and to get the price to go up, and then they just sold everything. Um, but that's actually how I found out about NXT. Uh, around late November 2013, uh, shortly after NXT launched, somebody said, hey, Trevin, you should take a look at this. It's pretty much like MasterCoin, except it's running right now. Um, and this is our old exchange. Uh, this is really pain to, exchange, to use because the orders wouldn't do a live update. So if you wanted to buy and somebody beat you to clicking that, you wouldn't know until you clicked it yourself. So if you hesitated, you could really lose out. Um, but uh, yeah, NXT, I uh, started looking into it a lot. This is our old wallet. Uh, this is not my account. That has one billion coins. That's all of the coins in circulation, so definitely not mine. Um, but this is our old wallet. As you can see, it's not very good. Um, but uh, as Alex showed in some slides, that's how the wallet looks now, so it's much better. Uh, Jalorita is working on improving on it, but uh, it's come a long way since then. Um, I think somebody else had a question about the apps around it. Uh, before, there were actually around five different versions of this wallet. So people were able to change around uh, with it. But uh, I remember also around the time people were having troubles getting it on exchanges because it was really a different uh, technology. It wasn't just a copy and paste of the Bitcoin code. Um, so when they talked with exchanges, it's like, no, you can't do that. You have to do this. It's also built on Java, so it's a bit different. Um, shortly after I got into the blockchain space, uh, the cryptocurrency space, uh, the price dropped to $800 from around $1,242. That's a bit inflated because that was on Mt. Gox, so around uh, BTCE, that was the exchange that was popular at the time, which is now shut down because of uh, money laundering claims. Um, don't keep money on exchanges. The first Litecoin I ever bought was stored there, so it's gone now. Um, well, I mean, you can keep them short term if you're trading, but keep them in an account you hold the private keys to. Uh, so around this time, I said, you know what, I'm going to build a bot to try to do some to make sure that I can sleep, and when I wake up, I won't go crazy. 
Uh, so I was pretty happy about that, and it hit $443 uh, just about a week later, um, just around the time that uh, China banned Bitcoin or a Bitcoin exchange or something around that line. Uh, there were numerous posts on Reddit uh, at the time with uh, Chinese text and made up translation, and people bought it. And the text didn't have anything to do with cryptocurrency. There was one that was just like a, something about food. Uh, <laughs> people believed it. So, uh, interesting game at that point. Um, so I remember looking at my phone, looking at the uh, Bitcoin ticker widget and saying, oh, okay, dropped to, well, at the time when I woke up, it was like 600, I said, okay, that's okay, my bot sold at 800, nope, Windows update, uh, restarted my laptop, <laughs> I hosted it locally, so everything was gone, well, not gone, but everything went down about 50%, uh, Litecoin I purchased at 35 bucks was 15, that was not good. Um, <laughs> So that caused a lot of uh, changes um, in my perspective, but cryptocurrency changed a lot of people. Uh, yeah, as you can see here, the top post is the USA suicide hotline, and it was the the uh, atmosphere was a lot like that uh, in the IRC channel as well. A lot of people really going crazy. Um, I mean, it's kind of joke-ish, but it was also serious at the same time. There was somebody there who was saying that they promised the day before uh, to pay everybody's student loans in his family. And now he can't. Um, so this made me take a, take a look at it in a more serious tone. So I started looking more into the technology. I went back into looking at NXT. Um, but after a while, I had some problems with my uh, life. Oh, sorry, before that. Uh, I also looked into Dogecoin. So Dogecoin did this thing where they wanted to sponsor a race car. Um, when they did this sponsorship, actually, this team wasn't doing well at all. And then all of a sudden, when they sponsored this team, they actually started driving pretty well. So there might be some effect of that, although they also sponsored the uh, a certain bobsled team from Africa, I think. Uh, no, they still got last place. Um, it didn't work out. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I took a hiatus between mid-2014 and mid-2016 um, because I had some things going on in my life. Uh, I traveled around and I had to move multiple times. Um, actually tried to come here, but the Austrian immigration lost my birth certificate. So I had to wait one more year. <laughs> I still have the name of the person who received it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go after him, but I'm happy where I am now. Uh, so it took living in the North Pole, so I live yeah, right there in that circle. It's called Svalbard, or Spitzbergen. Um, I decided to go back into crypto to sell what I had. Um, I was really broke at the time, and I said, okay, I have a few thousand dollars in crypto. Uh, and then I found out that I lost 90% of all the money I put in. And so I was faced with two choices in my life. One, um, to either just cash out and hate the rest of this for the rest of my life and try to focus and see what else I could do, um, or try to understand what really happened. Now that the hype is gone, it's easier for me to get the correct information. Um, and I took a gamble and I said, blockchain is probably going to uh, come back up. Um, I saw that the Linux Foundation was looking into it with a Hyperledger. And I thought, like, okay, now it's, it's getting a bit more serious. Um, so I did something that wasn't risky, which was quit every paying job I had and started volunteering. Um, but yeah, and so I lived uh, in Svalbard. I lived somewhere around this area. And I just spent night and day reading and studying about blockchain. Um, it was very difficult to go outside. It was very cold. Um, <laughs> at one point in time, it was minus 29 and it was 40 or 50 kilometers an hour. The snow was falling like this. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a piece of skin that's like showing there. That was very painful. I, like, yeah, it was so painful. But it gets pretty beautiful sometimes. Um, somebody asked me about a photo about if the northern lights were that good. This photo is barely edited. Um, the, the pinkness is because the uh, sun's rays are, were bent to the point that it turned pink by the time it hit Svalbard. So Svalbard has four months of no sunlight. That's why I can stay inside my room and just read about blockchain for hours and hours and hours and lose track of time. Um, I have lunch at 3 in the morning sometimes. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's nice. It's at noon, it's dark out, I see the lights, and uh, there's some stars above as well. It's also so far north that the North Star doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, other than the times that I go outside and enjoy all of this, I'm, I was spending time inside um, trying to learn about NXT. So this is my message uh, to Boss Visselink, um, who was managing the NXT community um, Twitter, channel, uh, Twitter account at the time. 
Um, so Boss Whistling was uh, one of the founders of the NXT Foundation. Uh, they started in 2014, officially registered in 2015, um, running on a budget of around $50,000 uh, euros, or more or less, which is nothing compared to most uh, tokens at the time. Um, so yeah, I joined the NXT Foundation um, in September, but I started work for them in, in June, um, because they were working with the development team. At the time, Jolari didn't really exist as a public entity yet, so I helped them work around um, Ardor. I uh, actually built the first and second Ardor website, uh, not the current one. I uh, helped with the logo creation, helped with the name, uh, choosing the name. I wish I had more time for that. Um, but <laughs> overall, yeah, it's a very hectic week where I had to build the website, help design the logo, help choose the name, I think in like one or two week span. So, but lived in the Arctic, nothing else to do, so. <laughs> Um, it was a very uh, interesting moment for me, and I think this is something that I encourage to a lot of people who are interested in blockchain, is that uh, it's very hard to find the right education around blockchain. The really best way to do it is just to get in it and talk to a lot of different people to really understand um, how it works. Uh, the number one complaint even uh, within established blockchain communities is that the lack of documentation. Um, so you really have to go into it yourself uh, and fully understand how things work, not just from a technology perspective, but also the community. Uh, because it's a really it's a really big part of uh, what how the technology evolves on how the community around it uh, affects the development. I mean, of course, the developers get to choose uh, what features to add, uh, and in the end, get the final say. But the community really affects on how things get adopted. Um, so yeah, for the first six months, I actually just volunteered my time. Uh, I got some tips from community members, but I learned a lot, um, and it's. Although one of the poorest financial decisions I've ever made in my life, it's, I think, one of the best decisions overall that I've made in my life. Um, yeah, so the NXT Foundation shortly became a member uh, of both the Linux Foundation and Hyperledger, and I was brought in um, also to talk, uh, well, sorry, to attend the marketing uh, committee calls, and I got a little bit more involved because I thought it was very interesting um, how there was a large amount of development going on in a blockchain that didn't have a cryptocurrency to it, so that really exposed me a lot for blockchain for business. Um, to this day, uh, my company, Agabon, my, um, is also a member of Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation. Um, as Alex mentioned, I was the former director of the Ardor NXT group, so there was a problem with the NXT Foundation. Uh, well, there were a lot of problems, but uh, one of them was that people just thought we represented NXT. Uh, that wasn't correct. I mean, at the time when it was founded, it was just NXT, but there was also Ardor, so we were actually supported the of both. Uh, however, we were not the developers. Um, there has never been a developer who was a board member of the NXT Foundation. At least that I know of, unless one of them was anonymous. Um, and a lot of people would complain to us about you know, how things went, because a lot of uh, foundations, like the LISC Foundation, Ethereum Foundation, they were all directly related to development. So it was you know, reasonable for people to assume that the NXT Foundation was responsible for all of that. Uh, but really, we were more of like uh, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, where we spoke with businesses, tried to you know, help around with the community. Um, so we didn't really have a say on development, but we helped essentially all the community projects. Um, when NXT was created, it was very decentralized. Uh, it was started by this anonymous developer called DC Next, um, and they left around. It was created around November, and they left around April. Just disappeared and said, "You guys take care of it. Bye bye." Um, so it was really up to the community to just move the project forward. Uh, this developer named John Luke took over the main development. Uh, Leo Yaffe joined shortly after, um, but there was a need for an organization to really, you know, bring people together and so that businesses didn't have to go to the forum and ask questions there, they had somebody to talk to. Uh, so I wanted to clarify that a bit more, so I created the Ardor NXT group. I tried to find a better name, but I couldn't find a better one at the time. Um, and my role was just that to get it uh, running. I'm a bit behind schedule on that, so even if my director position ended on the 15th, I still uh, advise the new director. Uh, the new director is Elizabeth Mom. She's doing a fantastic job. She was also joined the NXT community around uh, 2013, so she's very uh, well equipped, not just in terms of technology, but also in understanding the community. Um, so yeah, this is my company now. It's called Agavon. Uh, it's primarily a consulting company to help other companies figure out if they need to use blockchain technology or not. Uh, there are a lot of projects out there that should really not be using blockchain technology. I'm not going to mention some of them because they have a coin to them and people are going to attack me saying that the price went down because of me. So I'm not going to say that. 
Um, but yeah, that's, that's my main uh, goal. I want to provide that service to companies because there's a lot of companies that are trying to push blockchain and there are companies that are saying, don't use it, but I want to say, you might need it, you might not. And that's, uh, I think, the right way to approach it. Uh, there's a lot of hype around this space and it's important to keep a calm mind about it. Uh, I know recently there's a lot of companies that just add blockchain to their name and then their stock price that goes up. That's generally not a good thing. Um, we're also working on some software projects. I'm closely following Ardor um, because it's really easy to build with. Um, and so if ever any project requires a public chain, um, I always tell them to consider Ardor as well as the other options. Um, that's generally pretty easy to build on. It. Also, I'm mostly familiar with it, so that's one aspect. Uh, but I try to keep an open mind. Um, other project I'm involved with is called, uh, one is called Seekos. I'm a co-founder. It's a company that helps other companies do fundraising. Uh, so we actually helped Jolarito with their Ignis ICO uh, with our partners at KPMG in Switzerland. Uh, and now we have a number of projects coming in. Um, we're also working on other projects that I'm not sure if I'm allowed to announce yet, so I won't. Um, I'm also still an administrator for Bitcoin Markets. Um, our Slack is growing quite heavily. Um, like I said, I invite all of you to join um, to talk about trading. Um, we have one rule, and that's be excellent to each other. So only friendly discussions, please. Um, I'm also a community fund trustee for Byteball. Byteball is uh, uses the directed acyclic graph. Um, it's not really a blockchain, uh, but it's a distributed network. Um, one of the key differences with it is that it uh, does not have any timestamps. So that's one use case that blockchain will have that this doesn't. Um, but it's supposed to be a lot faster in terms of transactions because it's multiple chains essentially going on at the same time. I'm um, also an advisor for Smart Cash. Uh, it's a cryptocurrency that's focused on merchant adoption, uh, but at the same time focused on community projects. 70% of all the mining rewards uh, go to the Smart Hive, as well as the, um, which is the team that's developing it, as well as the uh, uh, community proposals. Uh, so I feel like I've talked enough about myself. Um, do we have time for a use case? Okay. Uh, so, quick disclaimer, I'm going to be using the Ardor platform uh, for this use case, but it could theoretically be used on a lot of other platforms as well. Uh, so I'd like to, 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 sorry, I'd like to introduce you to Kaylee. Uh, she's a fantastic mechanic, and she just invented a widget that increases your fuel efficiency by 25%. Everybody loves that. Uh, she created a company called Serenity Enterprises uh, to develop this uh, to develop the product, uh, but she needs a lot of capital for it. Um, she doesn't really want to go the ICO route, she doesn't want to sell shares, but she found out that if she sold uh, a certain amount of her widgets, that would be enough to cover the initial costs, uh, sort of like Kickstarter, so she decides to have a pre-sale um, on Ardor uh, by issuing a, an asset which represents one widget, um, one asset equals one actual widget. So Malcolm, Gina, and Ron uh, each buy it, uh, they spend 100 euros each, uh, she prices it at 100 euros. Um, however, uh, Gina decides that she wants to buy another one, uh, but Kaylee said, nope, sorry, there's only you know, 2,000 out, uh, and I'm not going to make any more until it's in production. Um, she wanted to buy one for Alan, uh, her friend, so they decide uh, to reach out to people. Uh, Malcolm, meanwhile, unfortunately went broke, and so now needs a lot of money, uh, some money, uh, had to sell his car, and so doesn't need the widget anymore. Uh, through the Ardor network, uh, with the asset exchange, uh, they were able to post uh, their orders. So uh, Malcolm was able to put a sell order for 100 euros for the asset. Uh, Gina, meanwhile, was able to find this asset for sale on the blockchain, and so she bought it from Malcolm. Kaylee then says that the product is ready, and she tells everybody to, with the asset to send the asset to her account include a message there, including the address on where she wants the widget to be sent. She receives it and then sends the widget out to that address. Resale is complete and everybody gets their stuff. Uh, now you can say that, you know, this is exactly what happens in Indiegogo or Kickstarter. People buy the product in advance, they get it. Uh, but there's one key difference. They can't do this without a banking license or other financial license. Uh, they would be hosting an exchange, they would need to secure users' funds, and they would just need to do so many things for what essentially they won't make that much money off of. Um, they could charge some fees here and there, but then, like I said, they would need to host an exchange and that would, the cost of that would be so high and they would essentially be deviating from their uh, core service. Um, but over a blockchain, 
um, people don't need to have this, uh, these licenses because it's purely peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so that's one unique thing that even if it was more efficient on a centralized database, uh, it's still more viable to be done over the blockchain. Um, in the past, when I made this use case example, unfortunately, I had to tell people that, oh, you just, you know, you have to imagine there to be a euro pegged coin. Uh, but now you don't have to. Now with Ordergate, you could just go on their website, um, purchase tokens in euros. Um, you can have an asset created and then have that uh, be sold in euros. So it's now fully possible. Um, I don't know of any project that's taking advantage of this yet. So this is a free use case I'm giving out to people if you want to use this. Um, and I'm not starting one myself either. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, shoot away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. What is a classic example of uh, a use case where somebody should not use blockchain? But it usually happens. Usually, I, I can't use anything that's usually. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes, uh, just a business case. Uh, there was one that wanted to have uh, decentralized video sharing, and they wanted to store all of the videos on the blockchain. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So no, but they were very serious about it. They came up to me and said, like, hey, I want the decentralized marketplace with all of the videos. Where if they buy it, they get the video directly. They don't have to wait to download it. They already have it. They just access it. And I said. So you mean they download all the videos all the beforehand, videos. and that's when it clicked in the set. Okay, I threw the business plan out. <laughs> so there are other use cases, but like I said, it's, some of them have a coin attached to them right now, so I don't want to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you write it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, turn off the camera. <laughs> Is there any other underestimated use case of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency? Uh, voting. So yeah, uh, voting. It's one that's uh, really underrated. Um, In I mean, sense, like, like political voting? Or? Yeah, political voting, shareholder voting, any kind of voting. Um, you always have to trust, it goes back to what Alex said about trust, mm -hmm. you always have to trust the person counting your votes. Um, yeah, but you, you usually you do have the issue with uh, you have to somebody uh, has to prove that this or uh, this ID is actually that person. Yes, uh, so this might not serve uh, uh, sorry, Austria, address that case. Less, uh, we even work together on a project for e-trust. Yeah. Yeah. For Austrians or Austrian entities or people living in Austria, we are kind of blessed that we can use the yeah. mobile signature for that. However, if you come with a gun and you force someone, it's a yeah. handy use case yeah. at the beginning. But, but uh, a, a trust isn't that secure either. So. You, uh, mobile, that the mobile signature proves who you are. Um, and I, I don't want to, want to claim that the interest is not that SMS secure. SMS is not that secure. Let's put it that way. But if, um, if you possess the mobile phone of someone because you, you no, stole it from uh, him and so on. GSM is not that secure. Mm -hmm. Getting That's a gun code, you know? Getting yeah. a gun code for just one signature. Um, but you still, need to know, you still need to know the private code before you, you start the SMS process. So just claiming that Atrus is not secure is something that I can't stand for at this point. No, it's, it's not about Atrus, it's about the Atrus relying on the GSM map, which is not that secure, but that's another nice story. For one part of their security yeah. verifying process. Okay, I think I need to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, over a blockchain, uh, especially if you use, well, at least with NXT and Arder, uh, if you vote and there's a poll, you can always check that your vote was counted for what you actually voted you'd be able to check that in time. Um, you can't do that in any election right now. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, like I said, you can create, who knows the exact, 100% exact population of registered voters in a city at any given point in time. I mean, maybe some people do for smaller towns, um, but on an individual basis, uh, there's always a concern of, did my vote get counted correctly? Um, I mean, look at Florida uh, in the United States election of Gore versus Bush. Um, a lot of people said, oh, I voted for this and stuff like that. And, but there was no way for each individual themselves to check if their vote was counted correctly, but over the blockchain they can. So that's one that's underused right now that I hope to see adoption in the future. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, you're into Byte, Paul. What do you think about Yota and Roblox? 
Uh, I know about IOTA. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about the technology that much. One of the reasons why I agreed to be a community fund trustee is so that I can keep a closer eye on it and spend more time to research it. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go out and say which one's better, um, but I am researching by the ball. Uh, IOTA, there's a lot of development also, so I'm going to try to look at it, um, especially after their coordinator system is solved. Um, it, for me, it's a bit too centralized at the moment with, with that one. Uh, Bytebolt has 12 coordinators, uh, witnesses, sorry. Um, but, you know, once that's solved, obviously, it's, I'm going to step up researching all of them. Because um, with my company, I, I try to, you know, show the different possible solutions and try to find the really best one. So, so maybe ask the final question, what do you like best about Vienna? <laughs> Oh, there's still much to say. <laughs> I, it's it's. I just know the city. I, I don't know why, but I've lived in so many places around the world, and I mean, just easy to know. Small part, not hard. <laughs> but uh, like I've lived in London, and I like I could, when I was having my meeting this morning, I told the person exactly where to go, which stop to get out of, and which exit to take. So, uh, I, for me, it just it's very comforting for me the city. It's easy to get around, so I guess that's one of my favorite ones I told you early this morning. So. And uh, Trevin, he was actually the first person coming to Limesoda for a talk and accepting the gin tonic offered at 11 a.m. in the morning. What? Hero. So, thanks, Dylan. Please, uh, another big applause for Trevin. That's actually what I did. Played soccer for now, I think, more than 15 years. But back then, what we both didn't realize that playing computer games would turn out in a billion dollar business. And that's where we are actually now at the moment. This is called eSports. So, who of you knows what eSports is exactly? So, who is aware of eSports? Okay, let's say so. Maybe half of you. For the others, I'm going to explain a little bit what, what eSports is. So, it looks like this. Uh, the most uh, I would say famous game at the moment is League of Legends. So in 2011, uh, 12, 2015, so <laughs> that's right. It, there was the finals in Berlin at the Mercedes-Benz Arena, so not somewhere in Asia, in the middle of Europe, in Germany. Um, for three days, the Mercedes-Benz Arena was sold out, and the stage looked like this: five computers on one side, five computers on the other side. So two te teams playing computer against each other. In the middle, there's a big screen, and two people explaining to the public what's going to happen, so like in football. And the amazing thing is, like online, more than 30 million people, 30 million people were watching those games. And the prize money is also very impressive right now, 
it goes up to ten million dollars per tournament. So I just check uh, check the Grand Slam tournaments combined compared to tennis. Tennis is maybe like twenty million dollars. So we're getting really in the range of the biggest normal or traditional sports events with esports. Um, for us, for us, also very important one is the cash gameplay on esports. That's the first line here, and this is going anticipated to grow by a factor of 20 within the next three years. And to compare the size of the, of, of the fans, of the audience, in 2014, eSports was as big by the community as ice hockey. 2019, it's anticipated to overtake already American football. And all these famous um, soccer clubs you see here have founded their own eSports team in 2017 and 16. So also the traditional, let's say, sports teams are now moving its way to eSports. So we will see Schalke playing against Paris Saint-Germain, not only in soccer anymore, but also in League of Legends or Counter-Strike. And this, this is what's happening at the moment. And this is our market we are focusing on. Second story. I, I'm really disappointed with how sports or online sports betting works at the moment. Because it sets me up as a sports fan against the bookmaker. So I have basically to bet against the professional in this sports family. And statistically, if I bet like, I don't know, eight or ten times, probably all of my money has been gone from my pocket to the betting provider. So it's like a, a casino. And what we do, we provide a new system. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system, so I can challenge, let's say I can challenge Alex, or you could make your own lime soda group and challenge each other, or you can challenge the whole community. But the most important thing is, it's player against player. So if one player loses, the other player wins. And we just provide the ecosystem for that. Um, we're taking a, like an approach that is very famous in America. It's called fantasy football. And it's, if you know that, it's similar to that. And there are two big companies in America. They're called DraftKings and FanDuel. And in, I think even FanDuel was one of the fastest unicorns ever. So in America, it's already very big to bet against each other and bet against the book. So, sounds like a nice idea. Does it work? Yes, it works. We have uh, at the moment more than 250,000 people already on our platform. The platform is called Heroesphere.gg. GG is uh, the, the greetings of the gamers, so it means good game. And that's what you normally say, if you lose a game at the end, you will type GG for good game before you leave the game. Yes. And yeah, they placed more than one more than uh, 1.5 million predictions already on our system. And the third part of our story is, last year we made a major step for us forward. We are moving the whole system to the blockchain, because we heard already, blockchain is about trust. And what do you need if you bet other people? We need to establish trust. We want to uh, provide transparency and also security. And that's why we moved to the blockchain. And last year we created HeroCoin, this is like our, our, our own uh, cryptocurrency, and with that we, we have done the first ICO in Austria. So this was the first legal ICO in Austria, and I guess also one among the first um, ICOs in the whole European Union under uh, the respective legislation. Um, what you have to consider is with Herosphere, we provide the first use case for Herocoin. But Herocoin is really there to change the online betting world as we know it today. So any other betting provider could take what we do for eSports and say, okay, nice, this works, we take it for, I don't know, horse racing, American football, whatever. So we provide the first use case, but of course HeroCoin is open source, so every other betting provider, every new uh, provider could use also the system. And the system has a few benefits uh, compared to, to normal betting providers. So it's not only security and transparency, it's also that out of every pot played on the whole hero coin system, so on Herosphere or some other platform in the future, 1% of every pot will be taken out and will be distributed to all token holders. So it's like every token holder reserves a reward for holding tokens and as the platform gets bigger, also the rewards become bigger. On Herosphere, we will provide, for example, a set of games. But everybody, as I explained before, like Lime Soda, could come up and make your own prediction game, your own contest on our, on our system, on Herosphere, so you can bet against each other. And the provider of the game will also uh, receive a certain reward for providing and inviting the people taking care of the game. 
and yeah, and also of course the 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 platform provider like we for Hilosphere get also a smart part of smart reward out of it. So everybody will be rewarded who has done some work for the whole system. Um, yeah, we already uh, 19 people at the moment working on our product. Um, we have great investors, like for example, I think in Austria it's very well known, Michael Altrichter, he was the founder of, of KSafe Card, so he has a very good experience in the betting and the gaming industry. Um, also Hubertus Tonhauser, he was the CEO of Casinos Austria and Switzerland, he's now in Dubai and very well connected also in the crypto scene, because um, as CEO of um, Casinos Austria Switzerland, he was based in Zug, so he has all the connections. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we have also great advisors, um, Oliver Falkert from SV Law, he's really, uh, uh, I think, the, the best lawyer you can get for to make him an ICO. And, but also people like Günter Doppler, he was the CFO of Bewin for several years. Or, yeah, Evan Smola, he also helped us a lot. He's uh, the co-founder of Quick Singularity, I don't know if you heard of that, but it's one of the biggest projects, in my opinion, for blockchain in the energy sector, they're based in Berlin. Yeah. I, as I said, I would like to keep it rather small. I'm happy to have a little bit of Q&A going on. Um, the last three things I want to highlight is we are already on exchange. At the moment it's Coinbene. Probably in, within February we'll add some bigger exchange, so if you're interested in buying the coin. Um, we really try to push for as hard as we can to de develop and deliver a product as soon as possible. So what I can say within the next six months we will provide the first MVP that's really working on the blockchain. And I think that's a real big difference to most of the ICOs you have seen because we heard the, ex the examples of products already out there, it's like CryptoKitties and a lot of fun stuff, but there are not so much many good projects now working on the blockchain. So within the next six months we're going to deliver our first MVP. And the last point, also very important, we're still looking for developers. So if you know guys <laughs> who want to develop, start working on a real blockchain product, so we're, we're happy if you could just tell me there's something in Vienna, you could join the team, we're still looking to get more developers. It's really like a bottleneck for us. So happy to, to join the community. There's also like in the back, other guys of the hero team, we have Joe, he was responsible for the whole marketing, and Bernard, our uh, CEO and co-founder. Thank you everyone for your talk. And one of my most gifted students or alumni, he got a job offer from you and from, from GreenTube and he asked me where to go and I said, hey, you have a kid, go to GreenTube. After your talk I would maybe reconsider <laughs> but I didn't know you before, so thank you for the presentation. Thanks for having us. Um, <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, as I'm from Linus, you have to ask, what's the difference between Hero, um, um, Hero-Sphere and Betfair? Um, Which is peer-to-peer -peer betting, in yeah. the classical sense of our In the classical sense, it's peer-to-peer -peer betting, you have like an exchange, I've, and I really like Betfair, that's one of the coolest the betting providers I know, and one of the only a few ones who make really a difference product. Then. Mm -hmm. So, Betfair is really in a very innovative uh, stage, I would say. But it's still, you bet against anonymous people, right? It's just an exchange, so instead of the normal odds by a bookmaker, you get odds provided by an exchange. That's the big difference in my opinion. So it's, it sounds like the same concept. No, what we do is like, um, you should look up fantasy sports in America. I know that concept. Right, and that's what we do actually. So you have to organize in groups. You will, there are contests, so let's say we two can enter a contest and everybody in the room and we have to draft the team, so everybody can select players, right? We have to predict how the game will end. And if we predict it right, we get points. If our player scores a kill, assist, he, I don't know, kills a tower, whatever, he will get points. So you, in this whole group, you collect points. In the end, you have a ranking, so you can see exactly how I performed against all of you, and let's say if the whole pot, so everybody pays an entry fee of, I don't know, 10 euro, 100 euro, whatever he wants, and the whole pot will be distributed among the winners. So that's the big difference. It's like challenging with each other, it's not like a single bet. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also think about implementing like traditional bets later on, but that's our first use case, esports and fantasy. But we're also aiming to provide smart contracts, let's say, for traditional bets,
for a poker system, whatever, but this is to a later stage. First use case fantasy, organized in groups. And so, is it clear the difference? Yeah. That's, that's basically exactly this. We took like a prediction and tip spin, fantasy mixed it together, and that's our product for esports. Yes, it's a bit different in <laughs> licensing as well. And here you can just uh, imagine it like for the software world, you probably do it in your company, right? Everybody says, gives predictions how the game will end, you give a 10 euro in a box, and the winner gets it. That's what we do digitally. Any other questions in the crowd? Yeah, you can also do it later, having a beer and yeah. Yeah. talk about blockchain. I can make you a unique offer because we are building the first female esports team at the moment that is actually attached to a real soccer sports club in Austria, and I can't publicly say which one, but it's an old fashioned piano sports club that everyone loves. <laughs> so it's not a it's from a lower league, but it's some, something you I can imagine, love, yeah. and they won against Juventus some time okay. ago, but I'm not allowed yet to speak up the name. <laughs> and I allow you to be a sponsor with tokens for this uh, female esports game, and for League of Girls, you don't have to answer now, you just can sponsor one single token, and we buy a drink for the ladies. Um, but this would be really a cool idea to get hero coin and this particular cool female players team <laughs> together and join the I think that's an offer that I'm happy to accept. <laughs> Perfect. So make some noise and let's start with you. Kühlschrank ist da hinten. <laughs> <laughs>